About three years ago, I received this photograph from the UN's High Commission on Refugees as part of their fundraising campaign. I've hung it above my kitchen door so that every time I pass through that door, the photograph and, and my head collide. And this reminds me about refugees generally, but also about the project I'm working on specific to Palestine, the Nakba. Exile is strangely compelling to think about, but terrible to experience. It is the unhe unhealable rift forced between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be surmounted. And while it is true that literature and history contain heroic, romantic, glorious, even triumphant episodes in an exile's life, these are no more than efforts meant to overcome the crippling sorrow of estrangement, quoting Edward Said. On the left, land ownership and the proposed UN partition plan in 1947, and on the right, after the Nakba and Israel's War of Independence, 1948, and then another displacement in 1967, shows the armistice border, now known as the Green Line. The lighter Lavender area indicates Israel. Darker lavender Jewish-owned land dots show the destroyed Arab-Palestinian villages and towns. Symbolizing, reminding us of the Palestinian right of return. This in the Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. Yusuf al-Baba lives in Halhul, near Hebron, displaced from the Jerusalem Old City, Ga Ga Jaffa Gate neighborhood. <clears throat> Thanks to the woman on the left, Iman Wawi, she led me to Yusef and helped with the interview. And then in 2022, she told me he died. He was raised in Halhul, moved to the Old City of Jerusalem in the mid-1940s, posted there as a Palestinian policeman, then shifted into selling and transporting grapes grown in his village. And two years later, Israel displaced him and his entire neighborhood at the start of the Nakba. Often the entire family and many neighbors would gather during our interviews and photographic sessions to hear those survivor stories. Many already had heard them, but it felt to me like a way to remember history and plan for a future that is resistance to the Nakba. The Java Gate neighborhood of Old City, Jerusalem, with architecture reminding us of the Arabic origins. Probably the area is much like it was when Yusef lived there in the 40s. This man may have lived there as a young boy at the same time. Jalila al-Azraq lives in the Ida camp and is originally from Al-Kabu. She's the mother of Nadal, who is another of my colleagues and a friend. She told me she was nine years old when she fled. In 1948, she asked me to cut a sliver of a fig tree in her village and bring it to her to plant. Five of her children were born in one room. I'm to remind Nadal, her son, to send medicines with the next person coming. On the left, her husband, now dead. On the right, her son, often maybe currently in prison for his resistance against the occupation. Living room of her home, peeking in is Mohammed al Aza, who also lives in the Ida camp, and I will return to him later. Cacti indicate prior habitation, 
They were early, earlier used before the Nakba to mark off plots. They're nearly impossible to eradicate. And the prickly pear is sweet to eat. Rock wall in Akabu. The stones cry out, as do the cacti. Once Jesus' enemies told his disciples to keep quiet, and Jesus said, I tell you, if they keep silent, the stones will cry out from the Gospel of Luke. al Kabu and the stones in a row indicating life before the Nakba. A mosque. And I often felt the equivalent of invisible hands leading me to various places within a larger spot where I could indicate prior life. Shrine to a Muslim holy man. Cistern for gathering water. And periodically I'd find markers like this, but when I looked up close they were in Hebrew, which led me to ask, where are the markers in Arabic to the Palestinians who used to live here? In memory of Eliza and Menachem Begin, Menachem Begin, a former Prime Minister of Israel, known for leading a militant or terrorist group known as Irgun to establish the State of Israel. They were one of the organizers of the bombing of King David Hotel in 1946, killing 91 people and injuring 46 others. While I photographed in the Al Kabu area, I met this uh, young family, and the boy, or young man, asked me what I was doing. He asked me in a very gentle tone, and I said, I'm photographing beautiful places in Israel. He then gave me a list. I wondered, can I ask him, do you know anything about who and what existed here earlier? Hiking trails throughout Israel, how many Passover destroyed sites? Mevu Batar, Israeli Jewish settlement, a type of cooperative agricultural village similar to the better known kibbutz. I use a different color palette to indicate age because this building, with its Arabic features, may have once been part of Al Kabu. And to give you a slight feel for Mevu Batar, Mevu Batar is built on former lands of Al Kabu and is roughly three miles from where many of the refugees ended up in the Ida camp in Bethlehem. It's a climb, a climb of about 75 miles, 75 feet, and uh, many, often the um, Palestinians would have to carry their possessions. Sometimes they were able to use vehicles. Muhammad al Aza, known informally as Musa, living in the Ida camp. His family is from Beit Jabrin. He works at the Laji Cultural and Art Center, where he is a photographer and videographer, very skilled. In 2013, during one of many Israeli army incursions into the camp, a soldier shot him with a rubber-covered metal bullet right beneath his eye, as you see in the right, his right eye, while he photographed them. I met him later that year to interview and photograph. Later, he helped me with my project.
He believes this is the soldier that shot him. Shot and killed in Ida Camp, October 5th, 2015. My name is Abu Chadi, a 13-year-old refugee. I was standing just right here, hanging with my friends, when an Israeli sniper shot me dead. My soul will remain here, chasing the killer and motivating my classmates. I wonder whether the international community will bring justice to Palestinian children. Roida Alaza, living in the Ida camp, family from Beit Jabrin. She's about 16 years old. She knows all the Nakba stories. She's angry and an activist, like many of the youth that I met or heard about. She's with her father, Aid Alaza, who became one of my main colleagues. He's a math teacher in a public school. Owns, a, owns the building used by Laji volunteers for housing, studied in the U.S., and his son also studied in the U.S. On the left, Palestinian land cut off from Israel by the annexation wall, and in the far background on the right, the old city with the Dome of the Rock. Beit Jabrin, a crusader, cru, Christian crusader castle or fortification, which was founded by crusaders in the 1100s, destroyed and rebuilt, and the Palestinian site where the folks lived is nearby. Abed Fata Abu Shrur, known as Abed, formerly lived in Ida, now lives with his family in Silwan, a district of Jerusalem. His family is from Beit Natif. Abed is the founder and director of Al Ruad, the pioneers or the beautiful resistance. Some of his heroes. Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. A project for the photo unit of Al Ruad asking, What is home to you? Limestone caves are throughout the West Bank, left over from the ancient Mediterranean Sea. Al Ruad is creating a vocational training center. They teach people how to use machines like this, a computer controlled wood, wood carver, which then makes carvings that the center can sell. From inside the, the, the Ida refugee camp, a, a view that many visitors to Bethlehem rarely see, especially those interested in the holy sites. Military gate used by the army for quick entrance. The annexation wall or security barrier goes by different names. More about that later and how it affects life in the West Bank. The Israeli Jewish settlement of Harhoma, immediately outside Bethlehem, viewable from many places. In the city, it was started during the Oslo Accords in the 1990s by then Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin. It was built atop, built on top of expropriated Palestinian land. In 2019, there were 20,000 settlers. Settlements are considered illegal by international law. In the background, the wall on the upper left, the, the the camp was established in 1950 on Bethlehem's north side, not far from Rachel's tomb, which is near the wall. And because land is constrained, never expands, when the families expand, as they inevitably do, the only way to, exp 
to uh, increase living quarters is up. And so one can always tell if one is in a refugee camp by looking at the height of buildings. Often they're remarkably designed and constructed with rooftop gardens, for instance. A field trip that Al Rawad organized, taking people outside the camp, games, educational events, contests, music, building resistance, the beautiful resistance. National Dance of Palestine, Tabka. Abed on the left. In the background, Mahmoud Darwish, national poet of Palestine, political poet in the sense that the man of action, whose action is poetry. And to give you a sense of, of his sonorous voice, I'm going to play a recording. He will not be reading what appears in the text. يلعبان معا أقول لصاحبي من أين جاء أبن الغزال رجل وخشف في الحديقة يلعبان معا أقول لصاحبي من أين جاء أبن الغزال يقول جاء من السماء لعله يحيى رزقت به ليؤنس وحشتي لا أم ترضعه فكنت الأم أسقيه حليب الشات ممزوجا بملعقة من العسل المعطر In 2008 I helped organize a delegation it was part of Cambridge to Bethlehem People to People project. We wanted to call ourselves city to city, but because of controversy, that is opposition by certain quarters of our city, we resorted to people to people. Maybe an idea for your community, a relationship with a Palestinian community. Beit Matif, surrounded by Israeli construction, housing and industry. It's in the center up, all that's left, and that too will be confiscated and developed. Nearby settlement, Natif Halamed Ha. Notice the word Natif. Beit Natif in 1948, occupied and destroyed by the Israeli army. Fatima Al Kawa lives in the Ida camp. She's from Azure. She told me that rural life was self-sufficient, that people lived close to the earth, raised everything they, they needed, meat, vegetables, fruits, etc. Musa, who was translated, told me she often repeated stories in the interview, but her memory seemed sharp. She would like me to bring her some rocks from Azure. Musa on the right, her two great-grandchildren, the boy is holding a water pistol. Her home, and one of her sons showed me on his smartphone an image of Azure. 
Later, I actually found the same building, which is the second part of my project to return to the villages and towns of displacement. Raja Mustafa Ghanem lives in the Amari camp in Ramallah from the town of Lid, and he told us about a massacre in the Damash Mosque. Another of my colleagues, Farid Tamala, longtime Palestinian friend and colleague, lives in Ramallah with his family, owns farmland in Kira, the village. He's a journalist, an activist farmer, and a director of the Public Relations Department in the Central Elections Commission of Palestine. Rajab was 19 years old in 1948, the year of the Nakba. He worked with his father in a grocery store in the city of Lod, or Lid, goes by two names, Israeli and Palestinian. Hearing about Jews forced to flee from Europe, he believed Palestinians were to live with them and give them shelter because they were victims of war. He told us that he was forced from his home by what he called Zionist gangs. His family first fled on foot, carrying no water or food. They went first to Ramallah and then by truck to Gaza and then the Berej refugee camp. After Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, he moved to the Amri camp. He never saw a city again. Farid told me that Rajab, despite his stories, was frequently making jokes. I was able to find not only Lid, the town, but the Damask, Damash Mosque. And the a section of the Israeli army in 48, known as the Palmach, the Israeli shock troops, slaughtered at least 176 people in this mosque. Next door is St. George's Church, attached to the mosque, built on the remains of a Byzantine chapel or church, 5th through 7th centuries. The mosque was built in the 15th century. Both are still active. The mosque reopened in 2002 and faces Judaization, namely expropriating parts of it for Jewish-Israeli purposes. The minaret of the mosque in 1948. Refugees. And now the annexation wall or security barrier Begun in 2002, it's concrete in urban areas, a fence in rural areas, compared to the Berlin Wall, twice as high and four times longer. It'll be 440 miles long. 15% of its length runs along the Green Line or inside Israel, but the remaining 85% runs as much as 11 miles inside the West Bank, effectively isolating about 9% of the land and approximately 25,000 Palestinians from the rest of the Palestinian territory. So along with the wall, there are checkpoints, roadblocks, random searches, and the like. Here's Kalandia in 2003. Jeff Halper, noted Israeli-Palestinian, uh, Israeli-Jewish activist, anthropologist, calls this the matrix of control and notes that for a prison, the authorities need control only about 5%. 95, the prisoners control 95%, but that 5% is crucial. Checkpoint surveillance, x-ray machines, retina exams, thumb scanners, long waits, pretty much controlled by young Israeli soldiers somewhere in the area of uh, 19 to 21 years old. And this ends part one of my show.